Well, welcome everybody. I'm really quite thrilled to be introducing today's speaker. Uh, it's, it's a very thrilling thing when one is able to introduce a New York Times best-selling author who's been well-reviewed on National Public Radio, the Wall Street Journal, and so on. I'm going to tell about two minutes of the story of the background of all this from my perspective. It was about 11 years ago that I got a call from someone who said she was a reporter doing a story on pain. And since we all get calls now and then from random people, I was polite but non-committal. And she said she had been referred by a mutual friend who was someone who was a medical school classmate of mine who went on to considerable fame and fortune as a medical writer himself for the general press, that being Jerry Groupman. So I called Jerry and I said, Jerry, is this person legitimate and whatever. He said, oh no, she's a superb writer. And so I, I actually looked at one of her other books that she had written, which was a senior thesis for her uh, English major assignment at Harvard that turned into a best-selling book about how one student had actually uh, developed mental illness and ultimately murdered another student and killed herself. But it was a grippingly written book. And I thought, this person really is a superb writer. So I had the good fortune that Melanie came to visit us at Tufts. She actually attended a couple of classes at our program and, and mentions that in the uh, acknowledgments and got to see some patients in the pain clinic. And she was exceedingly thorough in her background work. I don't think I've ever met anybody, particularly considering that they don't come from a technical background, who was as thorough in researching and asking questions and putting together connections and challenging things as Melanie was. Well, she went on to write a wonderful piece in the New York Times Magazine, for which she is a staff writer to this day. And it galvanized many people. Somehow Melanie had a magic touch with writing that could evoke the emotions and, and sentiments that so many people felt but were denied a voice. After that, I, I guess I would say um, was in less contact with Melanie. Melanie went off to have a life and uh, develop a whole new life and got married and had a couple of kids. But she, at the same time, was continuing to write and to interview more people and to develop the article into a book. And unbeknownst to me, she also had chronic pain herself. So this was a, a, a journey of discovery. Melanie now has written, I would say, the most successful book in the last several years, it's a New York Times bestseller, as I mentioned. Based upon the incredible degree of knowledge that she accumulated, she was invited to sit on a currently sitting panel convened by the Institute of Medicine, which is a branch of the National Academy of Sciences, to consider the current state of the art of treatment of chronic pain and make recommendations about chronic pain. So uh, these recommendations will go to Congress, and it just it doesn't get any more prestigious than that. So we're very, very thrilled that Melanie is visiting our program in pain research, education, and policy. For those of you who are connected online, I'll say that if you are having any technical difficulty, this will appear in, in much higher resolution uh, in several days at the website for the program. So if you were to go to Tufts Medical and enter the word PREP for pain research, education, and policy, you'll be able to see a copy of Melanie's talk. I think I've spoken enough for now. There's a ton of other stuff one could say, but I, I really feel uh, thrilled and privileged that we have such an extraordinary person coming here today on behalf of our little program, soon to be a much bigger program, we hope. So I'm going to transfer the microphones and let Melanie come up. Melanie also does something which I think is wonderful, which is to deliver a talk just as one person speaking to a group of people unencumbered by PowerPoint slides and so on. <laughs> so I'll, if you want to do the honors. I am the last PowerPointless speaker. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is tough. Let's see. This one's for me. Okay, great. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, it is such an honor to be here. As, 
as Dan alluded to, this book really comes out of a decade-long dialogue with him about pain. And there is just, um, I have interviewed many, many people in the field over the years, and there is no one who has a deeper understanding of pain, who's really contemplated it, both in terms of, of the neurobiology of it, but also in terms of pain as an aspect of consciousness and an aspect of humanity, and really tried to grapple with the lived experience of being in pain and the meaning of that, you know, as well as, of course, how to treat it. And um, we referred to our dialogue in these years as the thousand and one nights of the story of pain. And um, I do feel that he, he was the intellectual spirit behind the book. And I also had the privilege of observing him at, at great length in, in the clinic as he treated pain patients. And um, that was enormously informative to me in learning you know, how, um, how pain can be treated. And I also really valued the opportunity to sit in on some classes in the master's program in pain, which I think is a wonderful program and very happy that it's still going. So I thought I would start by sharing um, just a little bit of my personal background, how I came to be interested in pain, because unlike most people in this room, I'm not a healthcare professional. I'm a writer, and my interest in pain is both personal and intellectual. Fourteen years ago, I swam across a pond with a boyfriend um, about a mile each way, and other than being tired, nothing happened. But that night, I was kept awake by a strange burning sensation in my neck and shoulder, um, a sort of hot, ashy pain. It felt like a demon was breathing on me. And that pain never went away. And I tried um, wishing it away, I tried ignoring it, I tried meditation and visualization. I was much more interested in alternative medicine at that point. Um, I, had, I, I did consult with my primary care physician who thought it was cervical strain, neck strain, or maybe a strain of the brachial plexus, the nerves in the, in the shoulder. And I thought it would get better over time. And a couple years later, I finally got an MRI and got a diagnosis for a type of an arthritic condition. But when I thought back and eventually began doing physical therapy and um, making progress with it, when I thought back on why it took me so long to, to really take action and get a diagnosis, it was because I, the model in my head was only the model of acute pain, and this is the model that most people have. Um, that is pain that comes from an injury or disease in the periphery of the body and sends signals into the brain and resolve itself over time. And so I didn't have an injury, so that seemed very puzzling. But I felt I didn't feel like I had a disease because other, other than the pain, I felt well. Um, and so I was certain it would get better over time. And I didn't understand the idea, the model of chronic pain as a disease in and of itself that worsens over time, that is maladaptive. And this, you know, this is um, work that many people here will be familiar with, but I just thought I'd review briefly um, some of the idea of pain as disease because it's really not seeped into popular consciousness. And there even is a, a real divide between pain specialists and primary care physicians who are often the ones who are actually seeing patients in pain in terms of their understanding pain. And um, primary care physicians that I've spoken with often don't have the model of chronic pain as a disease at all. And I think the, the sort of three um, basic ideas is, is that the nervous system is soft wired or plastic. I, I myself, without a scientific background, thought of the nervous system as hard wired, not something that could be changed. And, but that because it is plastic, pain, persistent pain eventually rewires the nervous system to become more efficient at transmitting pain. And the analogy that was um, 
explained to me that that I thought was the most clarifying was that of a river carving its way through a pathway so that the longer it flows the wider the path becomes and the more quickly the water um, flows so um, the longer the body generates pain the deeper level of neurons in the spinal cord are activated, the more pain nerves recruit other nerves in their service, and the whole system sort of winds up to be more responsive to transmitting pain. Um, many of the neurons in the spinal cord after a nerve injury um, uh, suffer from a phenomenon called excitotoxicity, where they become overexcited and die. And it's um, so Clifford Wolf found in animal models that after a major peripheral nerve injury, a quarter of the, of the neurons in the spinal cord die due to excitotoxicity and inflammatory mechanisms. So, um, and not only the, the directly involved ones, but the adjacent ones as well. And chronic pain also has um, very damaging effects on the brain. And work by A. Vanya Apkarian at Northwestern found that chronic pain dramatically atrophies the gray matter of the brain. And this, this was simply horrifying for me as a lay person, as someone who suffered with chronic pain, um, to read about it. I could almost not bear to read, read this study that found that um, a normal, um, normal aging causes atrophy in the brain, but the chronic pain causes atrophy twice as quickly, so that um, one year of living with chronic pain is like two years of living without. And his work distinguished between people with chronic lower back pain and people with a very clear neuropathic type of pain, a pain that comes from nerve pathology, um, and that is uh, reflex sympathetic dystrophy or complex regional pain syndrome, and that they had much more severe atrophy. And normal aging causes uniform atrophy um, within the brain, but he found that the aging atrophy caused by chronic pain was um, focused on parts of the brain that are specifically involved with pain modulation, the thalamus, parts of the prefrontal cortex. And so this is what I think of as the cellular secret of the chronic pain cycle, that chronic pain causes atrophy in the very parts of the brain whose job it is to modulate pain, which in turn leads to greater atrophy, which in turn causes more pain and so on and so forth. And the same thing is really true at the spinal cord level where many of the neurons that die are actually the inhibitory neurons, the ones that are supposed to put the brakes on the system. So you can see there that the cellular basis of, of the chronic pain wind up. So um, I wanted to um, now turn to the subject of what are the barriers for pain care. And so when I originally had this New York Times Magazine assignment in 2001, I researched it by visiting pain clinics in all different parts of the country. I visited seven pain clinics and I observed the doctors, um, you know, sometimes for a couple of weeks, sometimes for, I think the longest I was at Stanford for a couple of months, because I had a friend there who owned a hotel. Um, so <laughs> it's a very welcoming place to be. Um, and, uh, and then I, so I witnessed hundreds of doctor's appointments and then I kept in touch with a subset of those patients, about a hundred, very loosely by email for eight years. And I was originally planning um, to just keep in touch with them for a year and then write my article. But after a year, I really didn't have any conclusions. I was just beginning to understand pain. I um, also became very interested in religious conceptions of pain and um, pain in ancient Mesopotamia, pain treatment um, throughout history. And um, pain is just, since it's such a central dimension of human life, it really threads through everything. So I ended up following these patients um, uh, much longer trying to figure out the question of, of who gets better and why. What tra pain treatment really works? Is there a recipe for healing? 
And um, what I found, and I was interested, since I had seen their doctor's appointment, sometimes the initial consultation, sometimes you know, it, it was a follow-up, um, I was very interested in how does the doctor's prognosis actually match how, um, what happens to them? How does the treatment they prescribe worked? But then when I would follow up with patients, I would find that more than half of them would not actually follow the treatment recommendations um, or would follow them very half-heartedly where they never really tried them. Like they went to a couple of physical therapy sessions, but they never tried a good course of it. And so that was very vexing and frustrating for me. I would find myself scolding patients and saying, um, you know, you're ruining my study. Um, <laughs> This, this is the difference between a journalist study and a real scientific study. I wasn't afraid of trying to influence the patients, although <laughs> I wasn't very successful in my influence, but, um, but I did actually try to encourage them um, to, to, to try the treatment and get better. And, and then, um, but that wasn't that successful. So then I, I switched my interest to this question of, of persuasion and um, is there anything a doctor can do to persuade the patients to actually follow the recommendations. And seeing that, why are some doctors so much more successful than that in others? Um, uh, nobody has very much time. So it's definitely not a function of, you know, spending huge amounts of time with the patient. It's um, some kind of um, quality of, of the interaction. Um, and. Um, um, Dan Carr's patients, for the most part, um, followed his recommendations, and many other appointments I saw that had very low rates of the patients following, um, and, and residents often had very low rates, and so I thought that it began to strike me that that's one thing that doctors learn as they become more experienced, is how, how to get the patients on board and sort of really trying to focus in on, well, what, what is that quality of the interaction? And um, so I developed a series of questions I would ask the patient um, when the doctor left the room for them to get um, dressed. And uh, one of the questions was, what do you think the diagnosis is? What do you think the treatment plan is? And, and there was definitely follow off with both of those where the patient hadn't actually understood what they were. Um, because the intense emotions that pain evokes really do interfere with people's ability to listen clearly. You know, again and again I saw it was not that it was not explained um, clearly, it was really just that they were too anxious to take it in. Um, and then the third um, question that I developed was one that I found very predictive of whether the patients followed. And it's such a simple question. I was embarrassed to ask it at first, but, um, but I really think it was revealing. And that is, do you think the doctor wants you to get well? And the reason it seems like such a dumb question is you think that the answer would have to be yes. Like, who becomes a physician in order, like, to want their patients to get worse? Like, you, it, you know, it's not even a matter of being compassionate. You think just sort of, basic ego would mean that everybody wants their patients to get well, and it can kind of go without saying. But the truth is, it, it cannot go without saying that I really noticed the patients who kind of, um, I mean, no one said no, they don't, um, but um, the patients who kind of laughed and said, um, oh, I don't know, you know, I guess so. I, I, don't think, I don't think he or she is thinking about it too hard. Um, uh, they, they, they were not signed up. They, they were very unlikely to follow. The patients who said, oh, absolutely, yep, I know how much he cares. Um, I know how disappointed he was that the last thing we tried didn't work. Um, and I know he's really hopeful for this, um, but has a number of other things up his sleeve if this doesn't work, but I'm really going to give this a shot. You know, those patients followed. And, um, and I think it's particularly important with pain treatment because there really is no way most of the time to, to know what treatment is going to work for what patient because 
Um, the, there are many different types of pain. The pa patient could have inflammatory pain, they could have muscular pain, they could have neuropathic pain, they could have psychogenic pain, and the symptoms of these all overlay. Like there isn't often a clear way um, to diagnose them. And so you really do have to, and it would be great if there were, and there may be in the future, but right now you very often have to patiently work through different kinds of pain treatment and then sort of conclude backwards, oh, an anti-inflammatory works, so their pain must have a significant inflammatory component. So having the patient believe, having the patient keep faith uh, is a really important part. And um, by way, I myself was in a phase of being disillusioned with alternative treatment because I felt like it hadn't helped me. I'd wasted time on it. Physical therapy was the one thing that really helped me. And so, um, and, and to some extent, dreads. Um, but by way of contrast, I observed some alternative practitioners who the patients I was following recommended as, as you know, very valuable practitioners for them. And I was struck by how amazingly persuasive they were and how they got patients to follow these incredibly complicated regimes that really had no evidence behind them at all. And I felt like, um, like my mother always says, there's an inverse correlation between the price of the wedding and the happiness of the marriage. I felt, um, I felt that there was an inverse correlation between the expertise of the doctor often and, um, and um, how, how persuasive they were. And so, so the alternative practitioners who had very few real tools in their tool bag um, were incredibly persuasive. And um, they did things like they touched the patients a lot more, they would take their hand, they would lean in. Um, and um, all doctors will say at the end of an encounter, you know, um, so do you have any questions? You know, and the patient will often kind of mumble like, um, you know, no, um, but you can tell that that means like, um, no, they're not engaged enough to have questions. No, they, they haven't bought the plan. Um, but the alternative practitioner will take their hand. I, you know, I really want this. I really hope this is going to work for you. Do you feel that you can follow it? So they're really making a contract with them and a bargain with them. And um, they're usually paying for it out of pocket. And so they, they need and they want the patient to come back. And um, they have, have pretty, pretty good luck getting, getting that to actually happen. Um, and uh, it, it reminded me of an, of an anecdote a woman who had suffered from anorexia as a teenager had told me that she had been hospitalized a number of times and she had never liked the um, senior doctor who treated him. She had thought he was cold, she had thought he treated her with contempt. And the last time she was hospitalized, um, she was in a wheelchair, um, being going to be wheeled out of the building, and he, in his suit and white coat, he knelt down in front of the chair and with tears in his eyes said, um, if you starve yourself again, I cannot bring you back. I just can't keep doing this. And somehow it totally clicked for her and his desire for her not to do it was so much more therapeutic than any of the other treatment he had given her. It was somehow what made all of the other work they had done actually count in some way, and that was the last time she starved herself. And so, um, and and you know, when I said, "Did you ever tell him that story?" and she said, "No," and and I just thought oh, it was so interesting. You know, I wonder if he had any awareness that that gesture um, had, you know, had an impact. So. Um, and, then, and then the last question, which I added to the later on, um, when I've been doing it a couple years, was, and was, would you like your doctor to pray with you? And this was an interesting one because so many patients said yes, and no doctors said yes. And it, it, um, so I just felt like it, it um, was a very good illustration of the discrepancy between what the patient is longing for in the encounter, the emotional needs they're bringing to it, and 
the physician's idea of the encounter. And, and I, you know, I definitely don't think it's, I, I don't think it would be a good idea for physicians to do it. It, it would only I mean, in India, it is very common, um, but, but um, it's a society where Hindu doctors tend to see Hindu patients and Muslim doc, you know, it only works in a society where, where everyone's religious and where the practitioners and the patients tend to have, have the same religion. But I do think it's just worth thinking about how in a secular context, those kinds of, of, of needs and longings can be fulfilled. And I, I do think that really praying with a patient is about showing them that you want them to get well, even if you don't have the power to make it happen. And making the patient feel that you want them to get well, I think really does substitute for, for that in many ways. Um, the, I mean, the question of, of you know, belief is, um, I mean, another way of describing is just wanting your patients to have a placebo benefit because um, the, the question of belief is important in all fields of medicine, but in pain, placebo is so powerful. Everyone's brain has, has the power to modulate pain. And the question is really just how, how do you get that switch turned on? How, you know, how can you turn it on for them? How can they turn it on for themselves? Um, I, I went to see a religious festival in Thai Pusam, in Malaysia called Thai Pusam, a Hindi festival, where they do these very extreme self-mutilations. They thread needles through their tongues and skewers through their cheeks and hang fish hooks with weighted altars from their bank backs and drag them up um, barefoot up this mountain, up to the, these steps to the cave. And I had read about it and had read that the pilgrims weren't in pain, but I totally didn't believe it. Like, I felt like it must be some kind of trick. And it wasn't until I actually went there and I, I, you know, stood close. I could see they didn't have the involuntary signs of being pain. They didn't gasp. They didn't tear up when, when these, like, terrible looking things were being done to their body. They really were in a state of trance. Um, they believed that the God, I interviewed them through a translator, they believed that the God took away their pain and indeed the God or, or you know, a, a secular description, their brain actually took away the pain. I was so stunned by it. I thought like, God, should I try that? And then I asked through um, translator, um, what about infection? And, and the pilgrim said, translated them, um, oh, the God takes away infection. I was like, oh, no, well, the God's not going to take away my infection. <laughs> definitely, definitely not going to try that. So, um, and it, I felt like it was very, um, I was very interested in some of the modern placebo studies that morphine, um, what we think of as the sort of solid gold standard of pain relief is actually one third more effective if patients know that they're getting it. So, um, so even morphine relies on part of its effect with the, the patient's belief. If you give it to them covertly, it's just not, not as powerful. And um, I've always, I, um, a saying I really liked in the Ebers Egyptian papyrus of 1500 BC is medication is effective together with um, magic and magic is effective together with medication. So that idea that natural remedies have to be combined with something that is belief inspiring, I think is, you know, is very true and it's a very ancient insight. So. Um, I thought I would now read from some um, short sections of the book. It's a section called Pain as Narrative, and it um, looks at some of these clinical interactions. Um, and this section focuses on the idea of the way in which the patient's interpretation of pain can get in the way of them getting um, pain treatment, that, that the um, the clinician has to figure out um, what their understanding of pain is, because if they have a misconception of pain, they may not be open to the treatment. Um, and um, this section is set at, at Stanford, where um, one of the questions that Sean Mackey, who runs it, trains the residents to answer is what is the pa what is the patient's interpretation of their pain and in particular do they have what he calls sinister ideas of pathology and that is the idea that um, 
that their pain is not, their chronic pain is not a broken alarm that really feels terrible but signifies nothing, but that it actually signifies some terrible worsening disease. And so that when they feel the pain, they're also very upset and alarmed by the pain. Um, although they've all, um, you know, such people have been um, examined to see if they do have some terrible disease and, and, and they don't, they just have chronic pain. But if they have that belief, it feels much worse. So Ed, a young telemarketing manager, came to Stanford complaining of pain running into his testicles following a hernia repair operation. And this is very common, about 10% of people um, who have hernia repair operations end up with chronic pain from nerve damage. The pain was so severe he could barely sit down, yet he had refused pain medication. The resident probed his reasons why and elicited Ed's belief that medication would mask the pain and that therefore the pain might be getting worse without his knowing it. The resident explained that pain is a perception, so it can't secretly worsen without awareness. Conversely, if the medication mitigated his pain, he would not be diluted by the drug, he would genuinely have less pain. I don't want the problem. I don't want to cover up the pain. I want the problem cured, Ed said sharply. The problem is the pain, the resident said. The nerve was damaged or severed during the, during the hernia surgery. Your only symptom is pain, and so your only treatment is pain treatment. When the resident left the room, Ed told me, the doctor doesn't understand my problem. So he went to see somebody else. Um, so it was one of those things where um, the resident ha what, had told him what was true, but he just didn't check whether, um, whether Ed was persuaded, and just another you know, two or three minutes, I think, explaining it would have made the whole appointment valuable. George was another Stanford patient who had resisted treatment based on a misunderstanding about the nature of pain. Ten years earlier, he told the resident, he had broken his neck in a recreational game of football. Although he had been lucky to escape paralysis, he had suffered from chronic neck pain, which interfered with his concentration in his job as an engineer. Taking opioids made him feel fuzzy. He was considering quitting his job and going on disability. The resident told him to stay in his job, explaining that, quote, studies show that people's pain gets worse, not better, when pain causes them to quit their job. And, and this is definitely true, but that, again, that would be a difference between a resident and a doctor would never just quote a study. Um, like, that's not persuasive at all. He, you know, um, he needs specifically to find out the meaning of George's job to him and to try to reinforce that. The resident suggested adding to his drug regime an antidepressant, Cymbalta, the first drug specifically approved to treat a type of neuropathic pain and recently now approved to treat muscular skeletal pain as well. I'm not depressed. I'm in frickin' pain, George said. It's normal to be depressed when you're in frickin' pain. What should I be doing? Partying? You won't be taking the antidepressants for their mood, but for their analgesic effect, the resident countered. George seemed skeptical. When the resident left the room, I asked if it would make a difference to him to know that there is some evidence that antidepressants mitigate pain in rats as well as humans. Rats, he said, sounding impressed. When the resident came back, he asked for a prescription. It had not been enough for him to be told that antidepressants effectively mitigate pain in humans because he, he believed they worked in the wrong way, a way he found insulting. But to work for a rat, now that was really working. <laughs> and so, um, again, the missing piece of explanation um, for him here, what, what he needed to, to, to sign on to them, was um, that antidepressants have an independent analgesic effect um, that, that the same neurotransmitters like ser such as serotonin that, um, that modulate depression also modulate pain. And so if you deplete serotonin in a rat's spinal cord, they respond more um, to painful shocks. Um, 
and because he felt that he was being pathologized and, and didn't like that idea and that his pain was not being taken seriously. Um, so there's also a, a first, you know, as I alluded to in the beginning, there's also a first person thread that runs through the book. And in researching the book, I read a lot of pathographies, illness memoirs. And I was struck by how they're always written with a um, very heavily influenced retrospective perspective where they present themselves as a very reasonable and enlightened patient. And I felt when I you know, looked back at the pain diaries I, I kept for a decade that my, um, I was not a reasonable um, or enlightened perspective and that I had a lot of misapprehensions about pain and, and um, didn't, didn't do myself um, any favors at many points. And I wanted to try to capture that mindset. And, and I know I did because I noticed a review on Amazon um, said, you know, I'm a pain patient and Ms. Thernstrom is a terrible role model for pain patients. <laughs> she, you know, her, she often presents herself as being very unreasonable. So. Um, so this, this is from one of the pain diary sections. And it begins with um, a quote from an article that I read later in my research called Dealing with Difficult Pain Patients in Your Pain Practice by A.J. Wasson, who is at one of these medical schools near here. <laughs> and, and it was very interesting for me to, to read this um, article as a lay person. So the quote is, even comparatively well-adjusted patients, I love that phrase, I was like, surely that's me. <laughs> so even comparatively well-adjusted patients can have the idea that their pain physician should be able to eliminate all of their pain and that failure to do so is tantamount to withholding treatment, the article warns. Some of the primary tasks a pain physician faces as a healer are to foster realistic expectations for treatment success. The only thing I wanted from a doctor was a cure. The first seven doctors I brought my MRI films to were not inclined to offer this, and neither, I realized 10 minutes into the consultation, was the eighth. I had gone to see a rheumatologist who had sent me to the jock, a physiatrist. The jock, as I thought of him, a short man in his early 30s with an aggressive manner and an alienating buzz cut whom I dismissively pegged as a former hockey player was talking to me about the same treatments other doctors had suggested, physical therapy, steroid injections, anti-inflammatories, more physical therapy. I tuned out as he detailed them because I felt he was fundamentally talking in the wrong way. There were two modes of discourse in medicine I had recently realized. There is the cure mode, the one I had always been in before, in which the doctor said things like, take this and call me if you don't feel better and we'll give you something else. Then he would scribble a prescription that would put an end to it. This was the way I liked to interact with doctors. Problem, solution, gratitude. But there was another mode I now realized, the treatment mode. In the treatment mode, appointments were long and they involved an unknown number of follow-ups and referrals to multiple other healthcare professionals. Conversation centered on improvement and reduction and management, as in, the goal is to reduce your pain to a manageable level. That was not my goal. I appreciated that the cure for my pain must not be obvious, but I still felt that if the jock realized I was only interested in the cure option, he should be able to come up with something else. I wasn't asking him to think outside my box. The treatment mode simply wasn't my box. Could surgery fix my problems? I like the idea of that, cutting out my pain like a tumor. Not with a multi-level problem, he said. Surgery can't fix degeneration of the cartilage, blah, blah, blah. So you'll give physical therapy a try, he concluded. I frowned. I told you, I already gave it a try. If I did physical therapy, would I be able to canoe? Hmm, he said, we'll have to see how your shoulder progresses, and began to dis discuss rotator cuff disease. Is canoeing important to you? Critical, I said with great feeling. Despite my lifelong dislike of canoeing, 
the idea that I would never be able to change my mind and take an interest in it suddenly seemed terribly sad. <laughs> and kayaking, I added, for good measure, something I've never even tried. Paddling is hard on the rotator cuff, he said. We'll have to see. If I did physical therapy, how long would it take? You should see improvement within three or four months. But when would it be normal? When would I be able to canoe? He demurred. I want to set a definite date. I'm not doing PT without a definite date. I can tell you in my experience, once these things become chronic, they rarely, if ever, go away, he snapped. I began to weep. As I left, everyone stared, the receptionist, the nurses, the other patients in the waiting room. I went to the bathroom, ran cold water over my face, but tears kept burbling up. He said it couldn't be normal, I complained to the rheumatologist who had referred me to the jock. He did, the rheumatologist said. I nodded, tears beginning to well again at the memory of the pronouncement. I am very surprised. I don't know why he would talk to you like that. He looked genuinely perturbed. In fact, I'm going to call him and discuss it with him. I nodded. He says he didn't say that, the doctor said when he hung up. He said he is optimistic about your case. He waved his hands optimistically. And so am I. So there it was. I had manipulated the senior doctor into criticizing his junior colleagues. So the junior colleague would say what I wanted to hear. The absurdity of the bargaining mode in illness was suddenly clear to me. I know I might not get totally better, I said in a small voice. I just want to make some improvements. The rheumatologist nodded affirmatively. Absolutely, you can definitely make improvements. Let's walk down to physical therapy. As we walked, he began strength explaining how strengthening muscles can stabilize joints and compensate for nerve damage. I would heard it before, of course, but this time I began to listen. And really, that, that gesture of him, um, he was a you know, busy, distinguished um, rheumatologist, um, at the hospital for special surgery, he had a patient, a room, waiting room full of patients with really terrible diseases like, you know, MS and RA and people in wheelchairs. And the fact that he walked me down, took the elevator down to physical therapy in, in the basement and actually talked to the physical therapist he wanted me to work with, who was an expert in shoulders. And I could tell from the way he talked to her that he respected her and that he actually thought this treatment was going to a huge impression on me. And so, you know, again, it's one of those things It took an extra like seven minutes from the appointment. And that was actually what made the appointment worthwhile. And that was really the turning point for me in getting treatment because of all the treatments I tried. Um, physical therapy is the one that I, I still do and the one that really does actually um, make a difference. So, um, so, in conclusion, I wanted to close by reading some stanzas from an ancient Babylonian poem that I um, encountered called The Poem of the Righteous Sufferer that was written in 1500 BC a thousand years before Job, and it's an incredibly sort of piercing modern voice and describes the state of mind of someone struggling with what is the meaning of being beset by pain and illness. And, and I, you know, I had known that there was literature that old, but I didn't actually, I didn't think there was any kind of I assumed it was like ancient Mesopotamian laundry lists or jurisprudence. I didn't really know there was any um, meaningful, self-conscious poetry that old. And so it was, made a great impression on me. And the one piece of background you need to know to understand it is that in ancient Mesopotamia, there is no such thing as natural causes for illness or death. Um, that is, it all comes from the realm of the supernatural, from the contest between demons and deities. And when um, you become ill, the demons have attacked you. And when you die, the demons have won. And the demons are illnesses. Um, the headache demon has come from the underworld. Um, the stomach ache demon 
there's a toothache demon. And it's not that the demon causes headache, the demon is headache. That's, that's its name, that's its manifestation. And in early um, Mesopotamian Assyrian civilization, the powers of the demons and deities are about equally balanced. So you, um, it's, it's quite understandable the demons will prevail eventually um, with mortals. But as civilization wore on and um, the Babylonian civilization, the Sumerian um, turned into the Assyrian and Babylonian civilization, it came to be believed that the powers of the gods exceeded the powers of the demons. And so the demons could only um, injure someone as permitted by the gods' absence or indifference or, in fact, malice. And so this raised the very haunting problem of theodicy, the problem that the Judeo-Christian tradition is also preoccupied with, of um, why do the gods desert the faithful? Then, you know, what, what is the meaning of our suffering? And the Babylonians all had a personal god in the, um, who acted as an emissary on their behalf among the pantheon of gods and why, and a personal goddess, and why are those in particular, these lifelong relationships they have cultivated, why are they not coming to, to his rescue? So it's a very long poem, but um, I'm just going to read a couple of stanzas. My own god threw me over and disappeared. My goddess broke rank and vanished. The benevolent angel who walked beside me split off. My protecting spirit retreated to seek out someone else. I called to my god. He did not show his face. I prayed to my goddess. She did not raise her head. Debilitating disease is let loose upon me. Head pain has surged up upon me from the breast of hell. A malignant specter has come forth from its hidden depth. A demon has clothed himself in my body for a garment. My flesh was a shackle, my arms being useless. A crop lacerated me, cruel with thorns. No god came to the rescue, nor lent me a hand. No goddess took pity on me, nor went at my side. My grave was open, my funeral goods ready. So in conclusion, I would say that anyone in a state of persistent pain feels that their gods, whether it's gods with God with a capital G or gods with a low, lowercase g, have abandoned them. And so if anyone is, you know, whether they be a healthcare professional, um, a friend, a relative, but if anyone is truly able to enter into that space of intense isolation and abandonment, I think that is where the opportunity for healing lies. Um, and that's where the extraordinary physicians um, that I witnessed, such as Dan, um, that's really where their work is. So thank you, and I'll take questions. Questions? What did you not do that you were supposed to, or that your fear wanted you to do? Can you repeat it to Oh. Can you repeat the question? Right. The question would be, um, what did I not do before I became an educated patient that my doctor wanted me to do? I mean, the... Um, several things. So one thing is, you know, I just didn't like the idea of taking any kind of medication. I thought of myself as like not a pill person, as if that's like a personality type or a lifestyle choice, you know, just like I don't eat apples, as opposed to like, no, if you have a medical problem, um, you know, this is the great thing about living in modern times. You know, of course you would take medication. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, so, so for example, Celebrex, an anti-inflammatory, I began to take that, helped me a great deal um, when I got over that. But, the, but sort of more importantly is I just didn't, didn't do physical therapy because I felt physical therapy is totally counterintuitive. So um, I liked exercise. So I was already sold. I already exercised. I was sold on the benefits of exercise. So, so you know, um, but it hurt me 
to pick up things, um, you know, get these, this awful pain in my neck and shoulder from, from you know, carrying a purse, um, you know, or picking up anything. And I, I still have problems picking up my, my twins who are 25 pounds a piece now, toddlers. But, um, and so then with the suggestion of physical therapy, it was like, are you kidding? Like, you're not listening to me at all. Like, the last thing I want to do is pick up weights. Like, my arm feels better when I rest it, when I don't pick up things. And I, um, you know, and I it, would try it for a couple sessions. I think, ah, oh, this feels terrible. This feels worse. This is totally the wrong idea. And so, um, so I didn't, you know, have the understanding that part of the chronic pain cycle is um, you know, they, that, you know, say, say you have, you know, nerve problems, you know, in, in your arm, um, then, then the muscles be become atrophied, then you use it less, they become weaker, it's harder and harder to pick up things, and, and there's a downward spike, um, spiral, and you can only intervene in it by actually, you know, trying to strengthen the very part that you want to avoid, and that um, everything in your brain tells you to rest. Um, that resting is what you do for an acute pain problem, and the, you know, we're not really set up to understand a chronic pain in which the treatment for acute pain is exactly the opposite. So. Um, so I think, you know, those, those were things that helped me that, that I didn't, didn't understand. Um, and and I, I certainly wouldn't have been open to taking uh, antidepressants. I now take Cymbalta, which I think has benefited for me, and I w would have thought, you know, I'm, I'm not depressed, I'm in pain, just, just like George thought. Um, don't pathologize me. So, um, yeah. Yeah, in the back. Um, did I run across anything like that? What? That kind of tricks you into thinking that that body part does not have chronic Yeah, I haven't. Um, right, the question is he's read about um, mirror box therapy for phantom limb pain, which is this um, very fascinating treatment that I, I have seen someone do who had um, phantom, a, a young guy who had um, lost his hand in a car accident. and. Um, he had a mirror box and and he had had terrible hand pain um and the mirror box you look into it and it it you hold up your good hand the mirror box makes it look as if it's the other side and so it looks as if you have both hands and it's this totally fascinating thing where phantom pain is thought to lie in um, primarily in a problem with the part of the brain that maps the body, um, the somatosensory cortex. And so um, the neurons that are used to receiving the normal input from the hand, um, when you lose your hand, they stop receiving that input and they become alarmed and that alarm somehow you know, translates as, as pain. And so you, you know, the conscious parts of your brain know where your hand is. Um, it, it was lost, but the part, that part of your brain doesn't know. But somehow with the mirror box, the image of your hand feeds into the visual cortex and somehow communicates with that part of your brain and makes it think that your hand is now okay. And people um, experience um, less pain. Often people with phantom limb pain will have a cramping sensation in their hand and they will like uncurl their hand and their brain will see, oh, the hand's being uncurled and it will stop having that cramping sensation. So it's, it's very fascinating. I mean, I, I never, uh, you know, before doing this research, I didn't understand that the brain has these different parts that have any problem communicating with each other. Like I thought that the brain was all one. And so it's a very um, interesting thing how many diseases sort of involve um, problems in communication between, you know, discrete parts of the brain. And so I know that that model is thought to be more generally applicable to some chronic pain syndromes, but, um, but I, I don't know anything about the work or, you know, whether any of it's been shown, you know, to be efficacious outside. Dan, do you, do you know the answer to that? Ongoing. Ongoing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great idea. Yeah. I find that we have
have various ways of talking metaphorically about diseases. And I think one of the most common is sort of a military type metaphor, how we're battling something. Right. Um, but I imagine that with chronic pain, that way of talking about, thinking about disease might not be very helpful. And I'm, I'm wondering if in your studies you found ways that people or yourself have uh, come to talk about this or, or think about this, visualizing it. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting comment. Now, should I repeat? The, okay, so, um, so the comment is that we often talk about battling disease with military metaphors, you know, um, um, uh, battle it, cancer is advancing um, and we're, um, you know, battling it. And that that is not necessarily that helpful for chronic pain and what might be helpful ways of conceiving of chronic pain. Um, I mean, I know for myself, I had the idea at the beginning that I had to be 100% cured, that it was my um, basic human right as someone, you know, living a privileged person in the Western world, living in the 20, 20, late 20th century, um, to be absolutely pain free. And so therefore, um, sort of modest treatments I, I felt like I didn't want to be bothered with them because they weren't a cure. And I was searching for that, you know, magic cure. And then when I finally accepted that there was no cure and um, started to do, you know, more modest treatments, what I actually found is that having a low level of pain is completely fine. Having a greater level of pain is not fine at all. And so if pain is the first or second thing on your mind, it just drives you absolutely crazy, like life isn't worth living. Um, if pain is in the background of your consciousness, the fifth or sixth thing, it's, it, as long as you can direct your attention away from it and onto other things, and it's not so aggressive that it won't let you direct your attention away, then you know, it's completely fine. And it's the difference between being slightly hungry or slightly cold and being starving or freezing. And so, um, so I think that, you know, you definitely couldn't have told me that when I was starting out, but I think that many pain patients go through that where they realize they can accept, you know, some level of living in pain. And that indeed often um, for, for patients who take um, opiates, often they have the idea that they just need to medicate all of their pain away. Opiates have these, you know, terrible side effects, terrible, um, you know, as well as problems with tolerance. They just often make people very out of it. And people would be much better off living with some degree of pain and having a lower level of, of medication. Um, and really, um, you know, really looking at, at, at the the balance between pain relief and side effects. And, and I think people often just don't do that. They want to be medicated to the point that they, they have zero pain in there. And it's really an emotional fear of being in pain that I, I think that they, they could get over. Um, so, um, so there's something about pain that, you know, we know that pain draws on the meaning making parts of the brain of the limbic system, the anterior cingulate cortex. and so pain always causes feelings of dysphoria, of, of feelings of, of, of sadness, of anxiety, of um, dis, you know, disliking it. Um, but the more that you, you know, actually try to accept pain, the less of that kind of activation you're going to have. And I've been a volunteer in functional brain imaging studies where you change your thoughts, you're given a painful stimulus, you change your thoughts, and you can really see that you're getting less less activation um, and that you're feeling less pain. So, um, so I guess, yeah. But I, I think the whole question of, of pain and metaphor is a very rich and very interesting one. Yeah. So pain and suffering are very intertwined uh, subjects. And I'm just wondering, um, and with clearly their problems in humans, and I'm wondering if you, what your thoughts, what you come across on what um, yeah, so the question is, um, is sort of the key concepts of, of pain and suffering, which are distinct but entwined concepts. And, and the question was, um, what are my thoughts on suffering in animals and how that could enlighten our understanding of, of suffering and pain? And, and the answer is, um, 
I really don't know. Um, I think that's a very, it's a, it's a great question. I'd be interested in learning and reading more, more about it. Um, uh, I mean, I think a good definition of suffering is a, a sense of loss of self. And um, that's why you can, the, the mystery that anyone who treats pain patients observes, which is that some people seem to have a lot of pain and very little suffering, and some people seem to have a huge amount of suffering and, and very little pain. And disability would be another you know, thing that doesn't match up with those two things. And sort of trying to understand the discrepancies and also um, trying, to, trying to influence them. Um, you know, if someone has, has a, a little pain, a lot of suffering, is there anything you can do to actually treat their suffering? Or is that just really an individual response? So, you know, I don't, I, you know, I, I certainly am an animal lover, but I, I don't have an understanding of animals, you know, sense of self and what being in pain actually um, means to them. So is there, um, do you, or is there anyone in the audience who could speak to that? Okay, we'll, we'll leave that as an interesting question for us all to look into. Oh, okay. Uh, did any of the patients that you observed uh, respond to nutritional supplements uh, as an alternative therapy for relief of pain? Um, the question is whether any of the patients I observed responded to nutritional supplements um, as an alternative therapy. I would say that some of them said, believed that they did. So I don't know, they were trying it in conjunction with other treatments, um, but that was one of the alternative treatments people tried. And um, you know, definitely I had patients report that it helped them. Um, so I don't, I, don't know, I don't know the truth of it. I don't know whether, um, whether it was placebo, um, whether it was giving them, you know, anything you can control um, is, is always a great thing, or whether um, really, chronic pain can be influenced by, by different kinds of, of diets. I mean, there is an interesting study of the effect of vitamin D on chronic pain, um, but, but I, I'm not sure about nutrition generally. Okay, I guess. Now, I'm going to, to uh, <laughs> remind people that all good things eventually come to close, <laughs> and we've been very, very privileged to see uh, the real deal, a member of the, you know, the New York Times and Vanity Fair and uh, New Yorker Literati, who got interested in pain because of her own story and wrote one of the most amazing uh, uh, books about it uh, that you're ever going to see. Now, we can continue this outside. I wanted to, it reminds me to thank Wendy Williams, the Associate Director, uh, for organizing much of this event, including refreshments and books and so on, and Matt Williams, no relation to my knowledge, uh, who also works in public health and uh, professional degree programs for making sure this gets over the internet.